Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Fusion Friday. My name is Alex Alvarez, Application Engineer here at Katif Technologies. Uh, so happy Friday, everyone. Uh, thanks again for tuning in uh, to this webinar. Uh, you know, hopefully you're having a pretty good day so far from wherever you're, you're watching us. Um, so for today, we're going to be talking about 3D toolpaths. Now, this is going to be a part two to this, uh, to this topic. Um, I do have a previously created webinar. Let me go ahead and share that inside the, uh, uh, the Q&A or the, the chat box here with you guys, just so that you guys know where that video is going to be at. Again, uh, this is a part two. So again, if you want to watch you know, part one to it, just feel free to tune into that YouTube video and, and uh, you know, just follow along. Uh, so now 3D toolpaths is a pretty interesting topic. So again, kind of touching back into, uh, into the, the part one or the, the first initial video, uh, 3D toolpaths don't or, or aren't necessarily just used with uh, organic shapes, right? So that's kind of a, a misconception that people always often think that, okay, we have organic shapes, we need some free flowing toolpaths, um, let's go ahead and use 3D toolpaths. So they can be used with prismatic shapes, they don't necessarily need to be used with uh, unique surfaces or unique parts. Um, and hopefully I can, I can highlight that and, and show you know, some of that in, in today's webinar. So again, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, again, any questions you have, feel free to ask away in the, the Q&A box there. Um, I will do my best to answer either during the webinar or at the end of the webinar. All right, so the why to this webinar. Again, we wanna understand the 3D toolpaths. Uh, 2D toolpaths for the most part are, are pretty straightforward. You, know, you select the chain, you select the loop. Uh, and then that toolpath gets uh, generated. But with 3D toolpaths, it's a little bit different. You really just have to select a, a tool and hit OK, and really the software is going to generate a toolpath based off of the model. And again, that's because 3D toolpaths are primarily driven off of model geometry um, or, or model surfaces, whereas 2D toolpaths, you know, they need some sort of chain or they need some sort of contour to follow uh, in order to generate a toolpath. So of course we want to increase program and efficiency. Uh, again, like I mentioned, with 3D toolpaths, you really just have to select a tool and and kind of let the software do the the heavy lifting for you. So what that means is less picks and clicks, right? You can, oftentimes what I, I recommend people is uh, try to use 3D toolpaths to generate templates for your setups. Uh, and again, hopefully I can touch on on some of that uh, here in in the webinar. So of course with increasing you know programming efficiency. Uh, that's going to allow you to, to uh, just stop wasting time in general uh, doing some of these redundant tasks. So what I mean by that is generating a setup, creating toolpaths, uh, you know, selecting geometry. Just, again, let the software do the heavy lifting for you and uh, just you know, create templates that are going to drive toolpaths for other parts down the line. And like I mentioned, feel free to ask questions. Is this a, a live webinar? Um, if you're watching live, if, if you're watching through YouTube, you, know, you can always ask. And, and we'll be glad to kind of reach back out to you as well. Uh, but anyways, let's go ahead and jump into the software here and get going. So again, if this is your first time uh, tuning into our webinars, uh, welcome. And again, just a, a quick overview of what we do here um, in, in Fusion Fridays. It's a series of webinars where we like to go over all the environments that Fusion 360 has to offer. So what I mean by that is if we click on the dropdown, notice that this isn't just a modeling tool anymore, right? So we can do generative design, uh, we can do sheet metal, we can do rendering, animation, simulation, right? So you kind of name it. Everything that you need to take your product from design and manufacturing is kind of built into this, this tool uh, or this platform. So again, what we do in Fusion Fridays is try to highlight uh, some of these topics mentioned uh, above here, right? So again, if, if there's a topic that you wanna maybe learn a little bit more or, or there's something that you, you're quite not understanding, uh, we do have a survey at the end of the webinar, so feel free to let us know what you what you guys want to see next, uh, or maybe you know if there's something that that we missed, feel free to let us let us know in there as well. So again, we, we do like to cover a variety of these topics uh, in our previous webinars. So again, feel free to go to our YouTube channel and and kind of check some of that out. Uh, but anyway, so that was the the different workspaces that you can that you can uh, essentially go into inside of the software. Uh, again, for today, we are going to be focusing on the manufacturing. Uh, so it's a brand name or a, a recently renamed uh, workspace here. Before it was CAM, uh, but now it's manufacturing workspace or manufacturer workspace, and uh, that's where we're going to be spending the majority of our time today. 
So again, for those of you that are new to Fusion 360, this is uh, you know where, where you switch back and forth between workspaces. Obviously, with the different workspaces, you are going to get a different uh, ribbon up here uh, with different commands. Uh, and over here on the left is going to be your data panel. So essentially, the data panel is where you're going to be storing all of your, your models or all of your projects that you're currently working with. Uh, so again, if you don't see that, just go ahead and, and uh, click on the top left corner over here, show data panel, and it's going to access you know all the um, all the different projects that you've created. So with that being said, you know you do want to go ahead and start organizing your projects based off of uh, you know what either uh, a project type, or in my case, I do like to split them up based off of different customers. So different customers that I've worked with, I like to just go ahead and and um, create a project for them. And then you know store all of their models in, in subsequent subfolders inside of the inside of the project. So what that allows us to do is uh, we take a look at this Fusion Fridays project. Actually, uh, again, this is where you're going to be storing all of your all of your data, right? So you can organize this in different subfolders. Um, you can create subfolders inside of these subfolders, uh, and and so on and so forth. But what I like about this is that you have this people's tab. And again, if you you know if you're a pretty large team, or maybe you guys have different um, you know, di different teams inside of a, inside of your company. Uh, you can go ahead and, and split this up so that you guys can invite the rest of the team members to a specific project. So what that allows you to do is it eliminates the the need to send files or to maybe have some sort of a shared drive that you guys are are working off of. Uh, just invite you know your the, the rest of the team to this specific project, and what that does is it gives them access to most or or the most up to date data inside of that project. Right. So again, you guys don't need to worry about versions or maybe someone created a, a newer version without telling you. Um, and now you're over here, you know, creating a, a setup or some sort of a CAM program on a, you know, on, a, on an older version. So again, it gives you access to the most up-to-date version of the part. Uh, and it always ensures that you guys are, are you know, in sync um, working, with, working with your data. So with that being said, again, we're going to be focusing on a a uh, sample data set. So again, everyone has access to this. If you guys have Fusion open or you guys want to follow along, feel free. Uh, so we are going to be using the CAM samples project. So we can go ahead and click on that. And the part for today is going to be this 3D milling uh, data set. So like I mentioned, we did do a previous webinar and uh, the previous webinar kind of covered uh, the top half here. So for today, we're just going to cover the uh, the bottom half. Um, again, it sh shouldn't be too long of a, of a webinar here. So again, if you, know, you have any questions as I'm going along, um, feel free to, to ask away. Now, what I'd like to do here first off is just close out the data panel, you know, gives us some more real estate to, to work with here. Um, and we're going to be starting off with the shaft and holder uh, model here. So again, we have you know this nice assembly. Uh, again, I'm not going to cover the uh, I'm not going to cover the, the setup and how that was created. Uh, we do have previous videos kind of walking walking users through that. So I'm not going to cover the setup or the uh, the roughing pass here. But really, the, the most important thing or the the takeaway from this webinar is going to be how do you control some of these some of these other tool paths, right? So notice that in here we have two parallels. We have a roughing. Uh, you know, and then you can kind of see that these are, are used for the, the finishing pass. I'm going to delete these and kind of start from start from scratch here. Uh, so again, shaft and holder. First thing you'll notice is that we do have multiple setups, and that's the nice thing about this, right? You can have your whole assembly um, and have your your fixture, kind of how we have here, and then have an each unique setup for all of the, the parts that you're going to be working off of, right? So in doing that. You do want to be careful in which setup then becomes active. So in this case, we can see that this little dot is indicating to us that the containment and heights setup is the, the current active one. We want to go ahead and change that. Let's go ahead and select the shaft and holder one to be active. So now what that means is that every tool path I create or I generate is going to go to this specific setup. Uh, again, you know, if, if you had this one active and you generated a tool path in the setup, it's really no no big deal. You can just drag the toolpath down and save it to your uh, to your current setup here. So again, we have a roughing pass. Let's go ahead and focus on the uh, the finishing pass. Now, for geometry like this, notice that you know we have our setup and our x axis is is kind of going horizontal this way as we would expect. Um, for geometry like this, really, 
a, a pretty good toolpath for this would, would be a parallel toolpath, right? So parallel toolpath, it, it looks at the x-axis and it just generates a toolpath parallel to that x-axis. Uh, and it creates it based off of the, you know, the number of, of uh, or the, the step over that you have. So in creating that parallel, again, we're gonna be focusing with 3D toolpaths, right? So you, you know, if you click on 2D and you, you know, you're trying to look for parallel toolpath, uh, again, you wanna make sure that, that you're in the, uh, the 3D toolpath here section. So again, 3D, we're gonna start off with the parallel toolpath. And again, if this is your first time, you know, kind of diving into the, the CAM workspace, uh, the workflow that you're gonna see here is gonna to apply to 2D toolpaths, 3D toolpaths, uh, fourth and fifth axis, you know, milling, really the, the same workflow is gonna apply in the sense that we're gonna start off with, you know, this dialog box. Uh, we're gonna start off with the, the tool, then selecting geometry, heights, right? So how far down do you want the tool to go? Passes, how aggressive do you want the, uh, the tool to, you know, to take the, those passes? And then the last tab is gonna be the linking tab. So how are you gonna leave in and out of uh, your part? So again, we're gonna start from the left, kind of working our way from left to right, starting off with the tool, and then just selecting our tool, right? In this case, maybe I wanna go ahead and select this, um, this little stubby 1 8 inch ball and go ahead and click okay. And this is what I mean too. So when I when people are, are starting off with 3D toolpaths, uh, they often you know they they go to the next tab, they start you know maybe changing the offset, they start clicking you know some of these these other options here. Maybe they'll they'll go to passes, you know, start clicking some of these options as well. Um, try to especially if you're starting off, try to try to hold back on that for a little bit and select your tool, like we just did, and then click OK. See see what kind of toolpath the software generates. Right. So right off the bat, like I mentioned, selected our tool and uh, automatically creates a pretty decent looking toolpath. Right. The only thing I would probably do is uh, probably shorten down the step, the, the step over here a little bit. So, again, if we want to go back to the toolpath, we can right click on that parallel, select edit, and now we can go to the passes tab. Right. So, again, how much or how aggressive do we want that, that pass to be? In this case, we want to probably minimize the step over just a little bit to, let's say, 20 thousandths. And then it generates a pretty good looking toolpath, right? So not bad at all. Let's go ahead and simulate what we have so far. And we can do it without the stock at first. Right? So it looks looks good, you know, from the from the just the naked eye without looking at it. Uh, we can turn on the toolpath and then do tail. But you know, a pretty good indication that something's wrong is not only the tool holder is turning red, but we also have all these little red check marks at the very bottom of our simulation timeline, right? If we hover over some of them, we can see that we get a, a note there. It says holder collides with stock, right? So if we turn on the, the stock on this one, you can actually see pretty good representation of, of what that's gonna be doing. Right, so you can automatically see that the stock is actually gonna get, you know, it actually gets chipped off here. Uh, what you can do too is turn off the model so you can get an even better representation and you can see clearly that it is gonna, you know, it is gonna hit. So we need to go back and fix it, right? So it's a good tool path, but it, it, it's going a little bit too far. A couple options that we can do there is obviously select the bigger tool um, or what a lot of people kind of uh, tend, to, tend to miss here is in the first, the first tab, we have this shaft and holder option. And again, if you didn't know what the shaft and holder option did, just hover over it and it gives you a nice little picture with a description of what that option is gonna be doing, right? So enables to specify how the shaft and or holder of the tool um, are going to, to kind of interact with your stock, right? And how to avoid collisions here. So we can go ahead and click on this and automatically we see that we get a few more options. So if we hit the drop down here, we see that we have you know these these couple options here. Uh, one of them is going to be pull away. So we can go through this one just so we can see exactly what that does. Uh, but pull away essentially is just going to drag the toolpath and extend it outwards, right? So wherever if it knows it's going to collide, it's just going to extend it outwards. Um, now that might be okay, but again, it's not going to be that efficient you know if maybe this was a you know our last toolpath and and we were you know kind of just finishing off already then that would be okay but we still need to machine you know the, the bottom portion over here so that's not really going to work that's that's a lot of uh, 
error cutting here and it doesn't do us any good. So we can right click on this, edit the toolpath once again. So instead of, of pull away, we can do trim, right? So notice that the last option here too, it's just gonna fail on collision, which again, it, it's okay, but it doesn't really do us any, any, uh, any good here. So trim, go ahead and click okay. And then we see that the toolpath automatically cuts off to where it's gonna be colliding, right? So for the most part, that's, that's gonna be what we're looking for. We're looking for the software to, again, let us know exactly where that's gonna, you know, where that's gonna collide um, and, and kind of cut the trim or, uh, or cut the toolpath off of where, where it's gonna give us those issues. So with that being said, again, you do wanna make sure that you have either the, the correct holder geometry um, and, and the correct uh, tool geometry in here as well, right? So again, this tool path is being driven off of, or at least the, uh, the shaft and holder option is um, being generated by whatever geometry you're using up here, right? So again, you wanna make sure that you have this geometry set um, and it's, it's, you know, it's close to as, as uh, real life as, as possible. So again, with that being said, you, you have a roughing parallel tool path. Um, now what we can do is, is, you know, machine the bottom portion here. Now again, for this one, you might need a, you know, a different tool. So we can go over here, edit the tool, and we can say we can use uh, tool number four here. Right, so this is where rest machining is gonna come into play. So if we just, you know, if we click OK, we would probably wanna turn off shaft and holder off at this point. So we click OK and we can see, you know, it's gonna try to machine the entire, the entire portion here. Again, we have, you know, so the, the top half already machined. So let's go ahead and edit that tool path. And if we go to the geometry tab, we are gonna have this rest machine option, right? So again, let's go ahead and turn that on. Now, what's gonna be the source for the, uh, the rest machining? Well, it's gonna be from the previous operations, right? You can do a, a, from the setup stock, from maybe a body that, that you wanna import uh, from a different file or just from a, a tool that you used previously, right? For, for this one, we wanna go ahead and use the previous operation one. And we'll talk about, you know, the, uh, the adjustment offset for, the, uh, for the, cup, uh, the cusp in a little bit. Let's go ahead and click okay. See what it, see what it generates. All right, so right idea, right? So machine the bottom half, but again, it's not machining up to the bottom over here. So let's take a look at why it's not doing that. So if we take a look at our roughing strategy, we see that we have some slots to leave, right? So the axial slot to leave is gonna be 20,000. So again, axial is gonna be in terms of the axis of the tool. Um, so it's gonna be referring to, you know, the, the floor essentially of the part, or that's what it translates over to. So in the parallel tool path, where we have the Cusp, right, so we have an adjustment offset. Um, we have it set to twenty thousand. So again, it the software isn't going to look at any material that's either twenty thousand or 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 less. Uh, so what what it's doing then is it's completely avoiding that section and it, it's not machining that. The reason why it's able to machine this fillet is because there's probably a little bit more than twenty thousand uh, around the uh, the internal fillets here, right? So if we bring that down to let's say ten thousand. that's automatically gonna generate a tool path, right? So again, a lot of people get confused and they try to, you know, they, they try to set that adjustment offset to zero because they think, okay, well, we wanna machine up to the surface. Um, that's not quite what this adjustment offset is doing. Uh, essentially, you can just think of it as, you know, if, if especially when you bring in a model, um, and I do have a, a previous webinar on this, but the model isn't what it looks like. It's actually a tessellated model. So on the back end, the, the, so the CAM software is looking at a tessellated model, essentially of like a mesh, like mesh body of this. Uh, so if you can think of it anywhere, you know, it has these little points or, or these, you know, like extra geometry hanging off from the sides. If the adjustment offset is set to zero, the software is gonna try to machine that. So you're gonna result in, you know, a little bit more of a noisier tool path is what I like to call it. Um, so again, you know, you want to find the uh, kind of a fine line there and and just go slightly before uh, below the the stock to leave on your previous toolpaths. 
um, and that should generate a nice clean, nice clean tool path. All right, so again, adjustment offset. Before it was set to 20 thousandths, now it's set to 10, and we were able to generate a nice tool path here. Okay, so that's going to be that's going to be the uh, the shaft and holder model here. Uh, again, the next one is going to be copy tool paths, and I'm going to go ahead and delete these two tool paths. Uh, and that's kind of what I'm referring to in terms of template, right? So again, you you don't need to have um, you don't need to have or or program start your program from scratch every single time. Um, if there's a tool path that you know for a fact is going to be similar. Uh, or you can apply it similarly to, to a, a model that you're currently working on, either create a template or do what I'm going to do now and copy the toolpath to that new setup, right? So we know that for a fact, these two toolpaths are, are good. You know, that everything's working fine with them. You can either do a control C or you can right click on the two toolpaths and say copy. What you want to do next is go ahead and activate that new setup, right click, and then paste the toolpath. Right, so we get the, the roughing strategy again, um, and then the two parallels that I just brought in, which by the way, have completely different geometry, right? So again, this one's gonna be machining kind of the, the top portion, and then this one machines the bottom portion. Again, don't have similar geometry here, but you can kind of see that it's, it's inverted. Um, but really what I wanna do here is regenerate the toolpaths, right? So I, a couple ways that you can do that is you can select the toolpaths, you can right click and say generate. But notice what's right next to it, right? So control G. And you want to start taking advantage of these, these hotkeys and that's you know ultimately going to give you guys a little bit faster programming times. But select the two toolpaths, click control G. And again, we don't have the same geometry but with 3D toolpaths, they're, they're strictly driven off of model surfaces, right? Or model geometry. So in this case, it looked at, you know, it looked at the entire model. It looked at where the shaft and the holder were going to collide and it trimmed that toolpath. And then it applied the second toolpath to do a rest machining with the same parameters that I had on the previous toolpath. Right, so what I could have done there is I could have selected these two toolpaths, right click, and then say uh, create template, right? So I can go over to the very bottom, say store as template, um, and it would automatically create those toolpaths as, as a template for, for later use. Uh, so with that being said, when you are creating templates, you wanna make sure that you limit the uh, selections, right? So what I mean by that is, you know, for the parallel toolpath, uh, again, you could have, you know, you could have done rest machining or another way that you, you could have contained that toolpath was by using the heights, right? So we could have either said, you know, top height and then selected the model top and then try to figure out exactly where that toolpath was, was stopping. But again, keep in mind, if you are going to be sewing this as a template, that might not apply to the next part that, that you use, right? Or that you apply these, these toolpaths to. Um, so you want to kind of think ahead and, and think of the best way to create toolpaths so that they're able to, you know, to generate with multiple different parts uh, in the future. Okay, so that was copy toolpaths. Uh, again, pretty straightforward um, example there. The next one is gonna be the, the slope. Right? So how to contain toolpaths with the uh, using the, the slope command or the, the slope checkbox. So in this case, let's take a look at what's going on here just to get an overview. So we have roughing toolpaths. We have what looks like a you know finishing toolpath on the floor. And we have, you know, kind of these surfacing toolpaths on that part of the model. So I'm going to go ahead and delete everything but the roughing strategy there. And again, turn on our slope setup. Okay, so for this one, uh, a few a few different options that we can do, right? So again, notice that we're going to be working with 2D geometry here. Uh, again, you can select either a contour and then maybe even use a 2D contour so that you can you know, create a, a rough with multiple roughing passes um, and then that'll give us a, a nice tool path. Um, or we can go over here to, again, 3D tool paths. And it really this is gonna be one of my favorite tool paths is the horizontal tool path. Uh, if you take a look at what it does, um, it automatically detects all the flat areas of the part and clears them with an offsetting path. Right? So very similar to a 2D contour with roughing pass enabled. 
Uh, but this one, it's automatically going to detect um, any flat surfaces. So this is actually a really good toolpath when you have, um, you know, maybe some sort of a, you probably have like a fixture plate, uh, some features, but you're trying to create finishing passes on only the flat surfaces. Uh, this is actually a really good toolpath for, you know, for, for that case. But in this case, again, we just wanted to automatically detect any flat surfaces. So let's go ahead and use that horizontal toolpath. That quarter inch uh, bull nose is going to be fine with me. And again, select the tool and click OK. Right, so it again automatically generates that toolpath. Uh, now, of course, you can go in here into the toolpath, go to edit, and maybe you want to, you know, maybe do a manual step over here and say, okay, well, I want to increase the step over a little bit, let's say 0.2. We're not going to be removing too much material from there, anyways. Uh, and then just kind of leave everything as is. Right, so there's our toolpath, doesn't look too bad. So now let's go ahead and focus on finishing this little feature in the center, right? So again, 3D toolpaths, uh, a couple options here. One of them are gonna be uh, a, a contour, right? So again, contours are for finishing steep walls, which this part has. Um, ramp would also be a pretty good one. Um, scallop, right? So a couple different options that you can do. Um, and I'll show you guys how, how to quickly kind of go through some of these different different toolpath iterations uh, without having to you know, select uh, the, the different toolpaths here. So the first one that we want to go ahead and, and try out is going to be this contour. So 3D contour toolpath. So again, we're going to use a ball end, ball end mode here with the, uh, the long series. Um, and then again, let's go through that same kind of that, that same mentality of, of clicking the tool and clicking OK. Right, so again, and this one had some sort of a selection, so it's telling you, okay, well, what do you want the bottom selection to be? Uh, for this case, I'm just gonna set it to be model bottom. And click OK. Right, so not bad. Uh, again, a, a pretty decent looking toolpath. Um, so now how are we gonna contain this toolpath? Now there's a few options, right? We can either contain it by selecting the, uh, the boundary, by giving it some sort of a boundary so it doesn't machine the outside here. Um, or we can do it by just containing the heights, right? So again, if I go to that 3D contour, I can go to edit. Uh, for me, I think the best case in this, in this scenario would be just containing the heights. Um, so I can go to heights and I can say the bottom height is gonna be a selection and it's gonna be the space here, right? So essentially, if you take a look at what's happening, I contain the toolpath to machine from this top plane here to the bottom of that that plane there, right? or that selection that I just made. I'll go ahead and click OK. And it generates that toolpath, right? So not a bad looking toolpath, actually. The only thing is, um, it, you know, it, as it's kind of machining the uh, the curve here, or the um, kind of the, the slope section, um, it has different um, different step overs, if you will, right? Or different, different thickness step overs here. And that's gonna be noticeable in the part. Um, now, depending on what this part is going to be, that might be okay. You know, you might be okay with doing some sort of hand finishing or, or you know, kind of sanding that down once once you're done. Uh, but again, we're trying to kind of limit that and and eliminate some of the manual work here. Um, so instead, what we can do uh, is we can contain this to only machine. And again, the contour is a great toolpath for um, you know for the, some of these steep walls. So we can contain the toolpath to only machine you know, along the, the steep walls there. So if we go to edit, again, we can either use heights, right? So if we were gonna use the heights tab, we can say, okay, well, we can just drag this, this plane down and we can drag it, you know, somewhere, somewhere along there. Let's click okay. And now we just contain that toolpath to, to that section, right? So that's one method. Um, we can go back, edit the toolpath, and I'm going to go ahead and, uh, oops, not the tool. Uh, so I'm going to edit the top height, and I'm just going to leave it at model top for now and change the offset there to be zero. So instead, and again, this is what we're going to be focusing on for this one, is going to be the slope containment, right? So we can turn on slope containment, um, and we can say, okay, from, you know, probably 60, 60 degrees to 90 degrees, that's where we want to limit 
that toolpath, right? So from zero to 60, it's not gonna machine anything at all. So click okay. And notice that it generated that toolpath. Now, obviously, you know, some of these portions are, are they fall into that category. So that's why it was it's machining these. Um, but nonetheless, what we can do from here is, okay, well, we kind of split it off based off of a, you know, off of an angle. What I can do now is I can come back up here and say, okay, well, now I want a scallop toolpath, right? So I can go ahead and click on scallop. Again, I'm going to be using that same tool. And for passes, I'm going to be doing the same thing, right? So I'm going to uh, enable the, the slope uh, containment. But this time, I'm, I want to do it from 0 to 60. Right? I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And I can go ahead and edit that, actually. So instead of being straight you know, 0 degrees, I can go ahead and say from 0 0.9. And then it limits that. So it's not looking at flat surfaces essentially by doing the point nine there. Um, but now it only limits the toolpath to the very top here, right? So again, that's a pretty large step over. So what I can do is I can come back up here and say, minimize the, the step over here slightly to 0 0.02 and click okay, right? So that generates the toolpath. And again, now we split it off into two different toolpaths. And again, you're not always just gonna be limited to one single toolpath for a feature. Uh, I kind of wanted to highlight, you know, how you can how you can um, contain it based off of angles, and then and and apply a toolpath to you know whatever its strong suit is going to be in this case. Um, so in this case, the contour toolpath is great along you know some of these steep walls. So only save it for the steep walls. And scallop toolpath is more for uh, if you can think of just organic geometry and creating offsets towards the inside. That's exactly what the scallop toolpath is doing in this case. Uh, what I can do here too is actually minimize the the slope angle, right? So now I can say from 55 to 90. So now it's going to go a little bit higher, right? It increases the toolpath a little bit more. So what that's doing now is now I'm getting five degrees of of overlap in the toolpath, right? So then that way you don't have a noticeable mark there of a of a transition from one toolpath to the next. Uh, but anyways, uh, again, if you wanted to, you know, kind of highlight some of the other toolpaths or, or see if, if, you know, something else was maybe going to work a little bit better, um, create uh, or generate a derived operation. Right? So what that allows you to do is we can come into this toolpath and I can say derived operation. It's going to be 3D milling. And let's say we wanted to see what a, a ramp toolpath looked like in this case, right? So we can click on ramp. Uh, we can kind of just go through the, some of the settings, but really it should automatically pull everything from the, the contour toolpath and apply them to the ramp toolpath in this case. So the tool is going to be the same. Notice that we still have that, that slope angle. Heights is still the same. Passes, right? So it still kept that 20,000 uh, step down. And everything else looks good here. So I'm going to click OK. Right, and then there's a, the ramp toolpath. So again, it has a little bit more transitions. Maybe we can fine tune the toolpath a little bit. But the, the point that I wanted to highlight was just how easy you know you can switch or, or generate a new iteration of a, of a different toolpath um, and kind of see which one is going to be the best one in in this case. Right. So for this one, I can say okay, I don't really like this one. I'm gonna go ahead and delete this one. And of course, you can kind of do this you know with with different 3D toolpaths. Um, and kind of find the, the best one. Uh, you do want to keep in mind, it, it doesn't go both ways. So you can't go from 3D to a 2D toolpath or from 2D to a 3D toolpath. It's, it's just going to be, you know, with whatever toolpath um, section you're, you're working on in this case. Um, so the last model is going to be pretty straightforward here. So again, we want to go ahead and, and keep that roughing. I'm going to go ahead and delete some of these parallel toolpaths. Uh, so again, pretty similar to what we have here. Uh, the only difference is that it doesn't have, you know, kind of a, a round edge here. So let's go ahead and activate activate that toolpath or that setup. Go over to 3D, and now we're going to be creating a parallel toolpath. Selecting our tool. In this case, it's going to be a 1 8 inch long series once again. And then the passes 
bring that down to 20 thousandths. And click OK, right? So it generates the toolpath again. Pretty good looking toolpath. The only thing is um, it's kind of creeping over uh, into the, the flat surface here, right? So I'm going to use a different toolpath for this, um, or I believe it, you know, might even might not even need it, but uh, in this case, it looks like it does. But um, anyways, I just want to focus the toolpath on the inner portion here, right? So again, a few options, either do heights, uh, which we did before, or we contain it using some sort of, of a boundary, right? So in this one, let's go ahead and, and contain that toolpath using a, a um, selection boundary. So again, second tab over is going to be geometry, right? This is where we want to contain the toolpath. Um, currently, it's set to uh, silhouette. We want to go ahead and change that to be a selection, right? Because we want to select the uh, the actual boundary here. Now, if we hover over it, we can see that it doesn't doesn't quite give us exactly the uh, the correct boundary that we're looking for in this case, right? So, what I like to do is I like to kind of start off. If you, if you can think of, of the boundary that you want, start off on the outside of the boundary. Um, so in this case, you know, either the, the edges here or maybe something, you know, along this line uh, would probably be the, the correct selection. So for me, I'm going to go ahead and select this, this flat edge. So again, right now we're telling the software, hey, go ahead and machine this boundary. Um, now, I don't want to go ahead and machine that. What I want to do is I want to go ahead and edit this specific machining boundary. Um, so to edit a boundary, I want to go ahead and click on it once again. And this brings up the uh, kind of the editing uh, dialog box here. So now what I can do is I can kind of hover over some other selections and see if it gives me the correct the correct boundary that I'm looking for. And it does, right? So if I click the opposite edge here, you can kind of see it in black. It, it selects the correct boundary and it gives me a nice little preview there of what it's going to select. So I can go ahead and click on this. Um, and you want to make sure that you know you don't click away or you don't click something else. Just go ahead and click on the accept current contour option here. So looking right down at it, it gave us a nice little projection of what that was going to uh, encompass. And now I can go ahead and say, OK. All right, so looking down at it, it's a, it's a great looking tool path. It looks nice. But if we take a look at from you know kind of the uh, ISO view, we can see that it's trying to kind of creep up on that, on that edge, right? So if we go ahead and we simulate this, we can go ahead and skip the, uh, the roughing pass there. Right, so we can see that it's automatically going to try to round that corner off. Right, in this case, we don't want that. We want a, a nice crisp edge there. So instead, if we go to that parallel toolpath, right click, edit. Uh, again, it's going to be under geometry. And we want to go ahead and enable contact point boundary. Now, contact point boundary does uh, one of two things to us or, or for us, right? So we go ahead and click on this. Uh, notice that it either extends the the boundary, right? So it, it sets an, an imaginary boundary, in, in if you know, in this case, um, and it kind of extends instead of going to the center of that boundary or, or having the tool stop right at the center, um, it extends it slightly, and it allows for the tool to kind of creep creep outwards a little bit, right? And that's if you enable it, uh, which in this case it's not exactly what we're looking for, right? So if you take a look at the bottom picture. You can see that that's actually doing exactly what we're looking for. Um, so on one of them, if it's disabled, it's going to go ahead and round off that edge. But as soon as you enable it, you can see that it kind of stops it right right along the uh, right along the edge. And that's exactly what we're looking for. So let's go ahead and turn on contact point boundary. Go ahead and click OK. And we can see that there's a noticeable difference here. And it automatically kind of stopped it from from rolling over, rolling over the edge there. Right, so pretty easy, easy, uh, kind of easy checkbox to to check. But again, it's something that maybe a lot of people aren't too familiar with, or, or that's something that you know they they're not aware of um, that this little checkbox can do for them. Uh, so again, if you know if there's something that you quite don't understand, just hover over the box and it usually gives you a nice little picture and it gives you a nice description of what that option is going to be doing. Um, I know that definitely helped me out when I was, you know, first picking up the software. So again, it, if there's something that you don't understand, just click on that or just hover over that, that uh, command 
um, and it should give you a good direction of, of where it's going with it. Uh, so again, that was uh, what I had for today. So again, if you guys have any questions, uh, this is a good time to, to ask away. Uh, it doesn't look like we have many uh, questions that's gonna apply to everyone. So uh, give it a few seconds here. Again, if, if you're watching this you know, on YouTube, feel free to reach out to me at alex.alvarez at kateeb.com. Um, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, but with that, thank you guys for uh, tuning in. Hopefully you have a great rest of the day and um, a good weekend as well.